Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this service. We thank you for all those people that made it over the line. But God, I pray for those that didn't make it over the line today. For whatever reason, Lord, they couldn't get here. We just intercede for them right now. Touch them where they're at. Lord, there is no condemnation in Christ. So we just ask that you bless them, you stir them, you heal them. You give them courage to get over the line. Stir their faith, God. We rebuke the devourer. We break every stronghold over our lives and our friends' lives. And God, we thank you for a revival right here in this house. God, I thank you, Lord. Stir something today. Activate something today. Or that I may decrease so you may increase. God, we thank you for the word that you want to put in our spirit to revive us, to give us a charge. Some fresh oil today, God. Let us be refreshed in our spirit so we can boldly live and make your name famous. We thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may all be seated. Thank you, worship team. That was amazing. Jamin, you're a stud. Jamin and his beautiful bride are moving to Salt Lake City. How many more sleeps? No, yeah, I don't want to start a fight. Are you guys okay? Lord, just help them. I know they had different dates. They're going to be fine. They're going to be fine. But they're going to go up there and bless our Salt Lake City campus. Just such a gift. We will miss them. But, you know, it's good to go visit friends you like, you know? So, I mean, no, Park City's worth visiting. I want to do like a church swap. Like, we go up this entire camp. Let's just go party in Salt Lake, take over Mormonville, and uh, inject them some San Marcos faith, shake it up up there, go up on the mountains in Park City, rip a couple days, lead Wednesday night and a Sunday, just one week. Be so good. They come down and do it here. Let's make that happen. Yeah, we're going to work that out. Anyway, it's pretty cool. I was like... Pastor Casey, Bombacy, man, you preached up a Wednesday, you got me all stirred up on Wednesday night. You guys ever get like Wednesday night, you go home and after like the Holy Spirit's moving kind of church service like that, and literally, I was loving it till about 1230. I'm like, Lord, I need to go to sleep. So then by one o'clock, I realized I had resentment in my heart towards Casey because I couldn't go to sleep. I was like... Lord, I mean, get me stirred, get me fired up, but don't keep me up all night. I'm trying to look prettier, not worse. Only so much collagen I can drink. I steal my wife's, but I don't think it's helping. But it doesn't matter. It's neither here nor there. But I was was thinking about it, so I, I couldn't just leave this. We're in this, you know, run the race, the race to win. What's our series title? Run to win? Run to win. Running to win. I like winners. And I like being around people that are winning. But it's amazing. When I grew up in church, I grew up around so many losers. And I used to associate losers with Christians. So it's so good being at a campus where I feel like we're we're stirring up winners. And with the Olympics going on, I love having my kids watch all these disciplined men and women in sports that just go after it. And I love, I I don't care how it started. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, but I do love the Christian athletes that are dominating and they're able to share their testimony and the platform. And I love it all. And uh, I get caught up, but I love just having my kids watch what that dedication looks like. Uh, Because winning is a formula. You know, winning, you can wake up and start winning, and it's the little wins, and it builds momentum to keep winning. And I realized, man, I love Pastor Jurgen because he has that, you know, it's like he squeezes the suck out of you. 
That's amazing. I used to think, what do I love about Pastor Jerry? He would blow so, so much sunshine my way, I feel like I could do anything. And I remember I was just like, and I always felt like I was pretty confident, but man, getting around him was like, I think I can. You know what? I might do that. You know, and, and it's so great being under that leadership of an encourager. And uh, I was just realizing, I think the way I grew up, I didn't like Christians. I definitely didn't like pastors. My football coach was my pastor, so it was like a double, like, I hated him during hell week. And I figured every Sunday was like hell day. So I didn't like that either. It was just like... My parents drugged me to church and I went, but I never saw power. And uh, I was talking to this uh, guy the other day, very interesting. He ended up coming to the nine o'clock service. It was so crazy. And, uh, you know, he was telling me what his beliefs were. And and, uh, I told him what mine were. And, you know, he was happy. I was happy. But I was just like, great. Have you ever read it? Nope just a historical book. This is actually not a book. It's 66 books, 40 different authors, over $1,500, over $1,500. I got ripped off. Uh, Over 1,500 years. It took to put this together. And it's amazing that people just think it's a book. But you think of all those, it's actually a historical guide at this point. There's been archaeological finds because of what the Bible wrote. They went and found some of that. So it's also historical. It's also prophetic. There's been many people that claim to be God. But there's only one that was prophesied over 300 prophetic words. And when Jesus was born, crucified, raised from the dead, he fulfilled over 300, all of them. Put that in chat GTP and look at that statistical analysis of probability. I mean, it just blows your mind. And so if you just look at it like a a book, your life is going to end up like it is. And if you want to start winning, you better look at this as a supernatural blueprint straight out of heaven that's divinely inspired that can radically change your life. And dad, don't be offended. I'm glad you took me to church, but I never, honestly, I just learned about all the stuff. Noah, I could repeat a bunch of stuff, but I never, I don't think it never went from my head to my heart. I didn't believe. I never saw power. I just saw a Logos word. What would the Bible say? But a rhema word is the Holy Spirit inside of me brings this Bible to life with the divinity of what it is. And that becomes a rhema word. What is the Bible saying? It's not just historical. It's still alive and powerful today. And, And I just want us to have a revelation around how important this is. Otherwise, we will stay the same. My job, I never wanted to be a pastor, I didn't think I would be. My grandpa thought I would be. He had some insights. But I just didn't want to associate anything to do with that because honestly, I didn't like being around lame people. I'm so glad you guys aren't lame. If I haven't said lately how much I love you. And I was asking, I was asking the Lord, I, I said, I can't help my filters. God, why do I say things and then they come out of my mouth? That then people you know, could think I'm, you know, judging them or whatever. I'm like, Lord, I didn't have to say that. He go, I don't know why you said that either. <laughs> like, you gave me a spirit of self-control and helping in so many other areas. Why does when things come to my mind that I want to say, why don't I have a filter? So I'm trying to work that out. So you just have lots of grace for me. But if I say it, just know that I love you. Most of this preach will be like that. And uh, that's between me and the Lord, working it out. But I said something really crazy in the first service. I didn't even get rebuked by the Holy Spirit. More so my wife. I got rebuked by my wife. Do you guys all have a wife that gives you that look? And you already know you're in trouble? But then if she doubles down on the look, you know it's not just trouble anymore. You might be on the couch. And then there's the third degree look. If she gave you that one, then you might as well call a friend and get prayer. None of you are there. God bless you mature Christians. Wow. So going on, I decided, you know, this is go fight, win part two, or I will fight. He said this word long suffering and uh, it hit me. So when Pastor Casey was preaching, come on, 
I, I felt when he was saying all these things, I felt one hit my spirit and long suffering. So I was just doing this thing and I was thinking about preaching on what does it take to have longevity? Like, I remember meeting Pastor Jurgen all those years ago, and my life completely changed. It was so crazy that one, in, one man could have such an impact because if you would have told me I'd be going to church, I'd be like, okay, I can believe that. I grew up going to church. If you told me I'd be pumped about going to church and I'd stay for a second service, I'd be like, huh, maybe, maybe. If I felt really guilty, I probably would. But no, if you told me I'd be going to second service, I'd come back and serve on a third, and I'd fi- figure out where a midweek prayer meeting would be, I'd be like, you're crazy. I'm definitely not doing that. I don't need any prayer meetings. I don't need any of that speaking in tongues kind of stuff. That'd be crazy. Don't be laying hands on me. It was just interesting to know that I could be passionate, want to go to church three times a week. When's the prayer meeting? Oh, we're doing a worship night. I'm going to worship night. Oh, we're going to go to some little, someone lived in an apartment complex and we're going to do worship in the building and people are going to stare at you wondering what you're doing. And then you're going to be praying in tongues with like 50 people passionately. I was like, I am definitely not Jonah in that cult at all. And yet I'm in there doing it. I'm like, how is this happening? I would leave there going, this is so weird. <laughs> then I thank God for Dr. Kevin Deddy. We went to college together, grad school. We drank the same Kool-Aid. So I'm like, dude, are we normal? <laughs> My friends in the chiropractic world, you know, I did some big stuff. They're like, what are you doing? I said, I don't know, but it feels right. Yeah. What are you doing? Wow. Like, bro, we're worried about you drinking the Kool-Aid. I know, and I like it. It was crazy because you're just in it. But I kept seeing God do radical thing after radical thing after radical thing. And my life, it was like my life was going from glory to glory to glory. My Everything started to win. And I realized I liked the friends I was around a whole lot better. Yeah. Yeah. I was living inspired. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I thought I was inspired before, man. I, you know, there's nothing like adjusting people, that satisfying crack. <laughs> I had the best crack in town, and it was amazing. You know, it's like nothing's more satisfying until you meet Jesus for real. That's like a 100x, not even on the same thing. But I realized that I was getting inspired so much so that I was starting to believe in what this book said. And my job today is, especially after Wednesday night, I felt like Casey... Just shoved it to the devil. Woke something up on the inside. So if you weren't here, you got you to gotta listen to it. But now that you are here, this is part two. This is more of the application of how do we do it. Because if you don't change, you're going to be the same. And if you don't like the results you've got right now, whether it's financial in your marriage, raising your kids, whatever it is, all that stuff can change in a moment if you think different. And the more you think in alignment with this, the faster you'll get there. And you'll get poked along the way and prodded along the way. And ah, I'm not really sure. But along the way, when you start to yield and let, as you get smaller, Christ get bigger on the inside of you, you will have thoughts and be like, I definitely didn't think like that a year ago. Okay, where did that thought come from? You start thinking different. You start speaking different. Your language changes, how you view, your filters change. You start doing things you never did before. I'm doing things now that I never thought I'd be doing that I'd actually consider, oh, no, that can't be fun. It's a hundred more times fun than I thought before. (laughs) And the people I'm with and doing life with, they make it so much more incredible than what I used to do. When I just didn't have the revelation of how powerful this book is. And I don't want to see Christians in my church be, well, it's Pastor Jurgen's church, but this campus be sucking at life. There's no other way to say it. I want to let you know that I thought about that for at least four seconds before I said it. Felt like I had a spirit of self control. And then it came out. <laughs> but it's true. It's like, 
When you watch these Olympics, something in you stirs like, look at that. That's amazing. When you look at Simone Biles, like she has four moves named after her because she's that good. She has been dominating. She's 27 years old. They say the average age is like 16 to 20 is older. She's 27, still crushing, still inspiring young girls, young men and women to be better athletes. You look at some of these track stars, they're just going for it. So my question to you is, who inspires you to be better? And if you're not waking up inspired, let's start there. We got to get you inspired so you can get some hope back. And when you live inspired, people want to be around you. When you are winning at life, people want to listen to you. They want to hang out with you. So we got to get to the point where we're winning. The devil wants to kill, steal, and destroy, but he wants to take away your hope, but he wants to make sure you're sucking at life so no one's inspired by you. You guys have maybe heard this story. I'm just going to say it again, mostly for me. But in 19, in the 50s, you know, there's a group of students going to, going to um, go look at John Wesley's house. John Wesley was this passionate man of God that brought a fire and a revival to all of Europe and even to Americas in the 1800s, in the 18th century. So it, it was amazing to see what one man inspired. And so these, this group of students went and looked at his house, and they went to the upper room. They saw his office, and they saw his bedroom, and the teacher was saying, oh, hey, yeah, they, one of the kids asked, what are those? You know, there's holes in the carpet. And they said, oh, that's where, that's where John Wesley would get now every night and pray to God to do it, use them. To use them for revival, use them to, so much so that there was two worn out holes in his house, in his bedroom next to his bed. And so they were all inspired. And anyways, they go back and they're headed back to their school and they realize that they were missing one student. So they did the head count. They were one student short. Teacher frustrated, went back in there and she walked back in the house. She heard, do it again, Lord, do it again. Walked upstairs. And there was a little boy next to the bed, not a little boy, but a young man on his knees yelling, do it again, do it again, do it again. In the same holes, teacher looked at him and said, Billy, hurry up. Let's go. We're late. That was Billy Graham. 70 years, 70 years of ministry didn't get taken out. He's in heaven now, but you think about it. What an epic man of God. And so as you... Look at that. That was inspiring. If you go back and listen to some of his old sermons, inspiring. I mean, he's got a fire in his bones. And all he would do is open this word of God and preach out of it. He gave some good tips to his kids along the way. It's funny. I just opened this. I didn't even see this first service. This is what my grandpa gave me right before he died. Luke 418, it was on a three by five card that my wife found because I thought he was so ridiculous, even though I love my grandpa. Go old Baptist Lutheran preacher. Fire hell coming. But I loved him. He taught me ping pong, and I was just watching the Olympics, you know, table tennis. They're going crazy. Uh, uh, uh. And I said, man, it sounds like my old man, but he was definitely not that good. But him and I thought we should have been in the Olympics the way we had rage war at that ping pong table. Everything. I remember even in his 70s, I don't even know if he could see. He was, and he's still beating my uncle, which was hilarious. And I would make so much fun of my Uncle Steve going, you know he can't see, and he's beating you. He would, oh, anyways, <laughs> the spirit of the Lord is upon you because he has anointed you to preach the gospel. That's his handwriting. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. And I said, yeah, you're crazy. And I thought I lost that. And when we got married, my wife found it. It fell out of a book. She had it laminated for me. That was sweet. But I think about that inspiration of Billy Graham. How did he go that long? And his kids actually said some really profound things about him. You know, a lot of people can tell me all the stuff about them. I don't look at what they say. The fruit is, what do their kids say about their mom? What's their kids say about their dad? What's their wife say about their husband? You could tell a lot more about somebody with what their other people are saying about them. And I loved it. They talked about how Billy Graham would sustain all those years. And they said... That one, his son said this, it's because he had a consistent devotion to God's word. 
And then one of the other ones said he, he had an unwavering commitment to his calling. What are we committed to? We may not know our calling, but God wants you to know that, that we all have a calling. To, we get to live this life once. Once we're in eternity, that's a whole nother bag of chips. For eternity, we get to be together. What are we going to do in this life to make a difference? Are we going to lead people and inspire people to want to know Jesus? Or is the only Jesus people ever know is when they smash their thumb and yell it? It's amazing. Can you think of all the words if you smash your thumb? That's why I love talking to atheists about the Bible and about Jesus. You think about it. No one smashes their thumb and yells, Muhammad. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Could you imagine? Buddha! Oh! No one does that. Because the only one with power is Jesus, and they know it. So in that moment, they yell the only name above all other names. It is subconsciously programmed in their DNA. They can't help themselves. So might as well get them over the line and be inspired and help our friends. You know, it's like, <sighs> Lord, help me. But thank God for Billy Graham and his unwavering commitment to his calling. They also said one of his most important habits is how much integrity and humility he would have. His family would see that. His friends would see that. It's like, man, he had so much integrity. Matter of fact, he was in Modesto one time and he felt the Holy Spirit tell him that he needs, if he levels up his level of integrity, how he runs his life and have transparency around it, that God was going to elevate him to do, have even more influence over presidents, over kings, over continents. God showed him this, so he wrote the Modesto, when he was in Modesto preaching. It's called the Modesto Manifesto. How many of you got one of those? So it's amazing. Say that five times fast. It was amazing because the significance of that Modesto Manifesto was that Billy Graham said, this is why I didn't have pitfalls in ministry. Wow. Came down to financial integrity. He said, I put God first, Matthew six thirty three. Second was moral integrity. You know, the, the rule became known as the Billy Graham rule. He just wouldn't get, he didn't want to be alone with a woman. Right. Just in case. He didn't care how it looked. He just didn't want to put him there. He didn't want to give the devil access to one opportunity yeah. to discredit him in a moment. Right. So good. So good. He said, I'm, I wanted transparency. And the fourth one that I thought was very profound is he says, I want to have unity in the home, meaning church. He said he would never go preach somewhere unless he was invited by a church and they could impact the local church because that's where discipleship happens. He knew he had a gift for evangelism. Bring him in. Introduce him to Jesus. Get him saved. But he would only do it on the invitation of the back of the church. And he says, unity has to be with the church, the bride of Christ. And he held to that. And when he had boards and all these people telling him, no, let's go here. Let's go here. He goes, it's not the Billy Graham show. It was amazing to hear that he would think through that, that he would have enough present time consciousness to sit down and write this Modesto Manifesto, which means in modern vernacular is maybe a set of core values for his ministry, core values for his family. Have we taken the chance to set up core values with our kids, tell them what's important, what it means to be raised? What, what if something happened to you or your bride and your kids are young, who's going to Teach them the ways of the Lord, your belief systems. Is it going to be your mother-in-law, father-in-law? Is it going to be your friends? This is why this conversation is so important because if we don't, my kids are, my kids are young, five, nine, and 12. She's 11, but she tells me she's 12 every day. And she acts like she's 20. You know, and, and winning is, is, it's important to instill that in our kids. You know what? My boy, you know, was, is nine now. He was in third grade and he came to me last year and he said that he must just be stupid. And the teacher called us in and said, really worried about, you know, my boy's math skills. And then my boy made that comment that he's stupid. And I said, bro, you don't talk like that in this house. Well, dad, I'm the, she said, I'm in the last place of the class and I'm going to have to figure this out. I'm just not good at math. My brain doesn't work that way, dad. I'm just not smart. And I said, okay, son, if you ever say that word again, you just need to pack your bags. 
I'm going to put you on the stupid train and get you out of here. <laughs> and what are you talking about, Dad? I said, well, do you know your last name? Yeah, it's Hubbard. Well, it doesn't go with stupid. So you have two choices. If you're going to be a Hubbard, change your language. Or go pack your bags. I'm going to put you on the stupid train. You can go hang out with stupid people. He said, Dad, where's that train go to? I said, it goes to Loserville, bro, and you're not one. And I'm going to tell you, you just got to tell it like it is. He said, fine. I said, you wait and see what happens. You build hope, but you got to know you can't just leave him there. So I said, said, you're going to do this Kumon thing and you're blah, blah, blah. No joke. Just a couple weeks later, he walked up to the front of the class and turned in his paper. He was the first one to turn in. And a teacher being programmed said, oh, Maverick, do you need help? You couldn't figure it out? And no, it's just not by the fault. He just, he'd be frustrated. He'd be the last one to finish. So now if she figures, oh, he just gave up. He's the first one to finish. And she goes, he goes, no, I got it done. She went through it. He missed one or two. Next thing you know, he went from last in the class to first in the class. And I'm going to tell you something. That little, that little win in his life where he got to see it and then the teacher called us, she was in disbelief, what'd you do? I signed him up for Kumon. It wasn't a genius. I just, I knew the program. I said, yeah, I was on that short bus too, son, and we're fine now. Look at us. We're Hubbards. No. But I was like, yeah. And he goes, dad, how'd you know that? I said, it's repetition. It's getting familiar. It's building your confidence around numbers. You built your confidence. Now look, then the other day, he's so confident. Now he's like, dad, look at my new shoes. My socks high. I want to go get a perm. I said, a perm? (laughs) Bro, you don't need no perm. Yeah, dad, I want a perm. Now he's got a perm. He walks around the house. You need help with anything, dad? (laughs) Whatever you need. I was like, bro. You get a little smart in math, and now you're trying to run the home. You're nine. Sit down. You can't even drive. But I love that because if we can teach our kids to win, it stacks. So many people in life are growing up with parents saying, you'll never amount to anything. You can never do that. You'll never, you know. In my, in my high school thing, they said, most likely to go to prison. That was my name. Don't let people prophesy over you. Yeah. What story? No, I'm not telling the mailbox story. Hey, I got to preach. I got to preach. So here's my whole thing. Sit down and come up with some family core values that have biblical meaning to teach our kids. There's so many good things. Like I want my kids to know the Bible, to read the Bible, to be in it. Why? Not because it's a lecture, but because it's power that's going to change their life. It's amazing that when you get them and tell them stories, like ever since I watched that movie on uh, the ministry of ungentlemanly warfare, man, Churchill, I've been reading on Churchill every day. It's so inspiring to hear a man that just would face his fears. He would keep fighting, keep believing. The question is, what are we watching? Most people are just watching stuff to fill their mind. With nonsense, the chaos, the noise of the world. But if you can listen to something that inspires you, I don't know, did that video ever work or no? No, that's so sad. They were going to be so inspired. Now nothing. It's like a lead balloon. Hmm. Nope. But here's what I want to say. As believers... Here's some, you can pull out your phone, scriptures, and a little note. I want this to be really application as I go through speed here, okay? Don't be naive. Too many naive Christians. And if you're a naive Christian, your life will equal sucking. You got to wake up to know that the reality of spiritual warfare. So many people are like, oh, yeah, no, it's just good. I believe in all people. Universalism. I'm going to be my, so positive. I was like, bro, I know the secret. Okay, I watched it. You need Jesus. They don't understand this verse. For we do not wrestle, Ephesians 6, 12, against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There is a battle going on, not just for Christians. The difference is, is we took the pill, we know the matrix. 
When you know Jesus, you can see it differently. You're like, oh, this is what's going on. There are strongholds, there are generational curses, and the enemy does whatever he can to entice young people to get off at a young age, to get them on the wrong train of life, and so they screw up their life, so they stop believing in themselves, they've lost hope, they realize they've gone too far, God must hate them, because all people deep down know there's something that created them. But if we don't live inspiring lives, people are never going to ask you for advice. I've never gone to a homeless guy and asked him what I can do for tips, for money. I don't ask, you know, people have been married five times. I'm not going to ask them, hey, looks like it's working out for you. You got any tips that can help my wife and I get along better? It's just, you look at the fruit. So if we're going to be the witness, the witnesses for Jesus, what's our life looking like? And I'm going to tell you, if you don't even know this, It's like, man, we're in this race. It's really a war. And the number one competitor that's coming to steal your your gold medal is the devil. He wants to strip it from you. He wants to beat you and discourage you. It's like the show Game of Thrones, you know? It's like, dear Lord. But wake up because number two is once you have the reality there is spiritual warfare out there, then two, God gives you all the tools. And the first thing he says is in Ephesians 6, right after that is armor up. Put it on. No one goes to battle. No Navy SEAL I know goes, hey, I'm getting deployed, but I'm not taking my gun. Nope. No, no, no. Every day, if we took this serious, we'd be armoring up, suit up. I'm not going to stand up here and preach in my chonies today. Thank goodness for everybody. And I tell you that, it's like, we got to dress up. We got to suit up. And God is telling you, if you're going to engage in this warfare... That you got to put on the full armor. He instructs us in that. I'm not going to read it to you because most of you all know it, but you may know it in your head, but do you know it to the point that you're doing it every day? This can be a manual all day long, but unless you apply it to your life, you won't be able to see the results of that application. You could have all the apple seeds you want, but if you don't plant them, you're never going to see an apple tree to eat the fruit of it. Next one is resist the devil. James 4, 7, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Know that there's a battle. Armor up. Submit to God. Resist the devil. It's the blueprint. The next one is just understanding the power of prayer and fasting. Sometimes we got to do a little fasting. It's amazing how many Christians I know that have never fasted. Yet, we're engaged in a war. Some of these demonic strongholds can only be broken through prayer and fasting. If you've never seen power in your life, let's just go put on the supercharger of prayer and fasting. And this is what's amazing. I grew up my whole life not understanding the revelation of prayer. My mom was a prayer warrior. I thought just the ladies were doing it. But I'm going to tell you what. That's how prayer started. It's just four dudes in my house, and we all stared at each other for about 20 minutes. We didn't say a word. I'm like, this is not as powerful as I thought, guys. We're not very good at this. We're all a little insecure, so we're like, who's going to go? And then we, we, we said something. It was all ridiculous. So I called the guy that inspired me to start it, and I go, bro, you got to come do it. And he goes, I'm not starting at 5 a.m., so I'll be there at 7. So the first prayer meeting ever is at 7, and I got to encounter what power looked like for the first time what it felt like, what it was tangible. And I realized, man, we, we got to figure this out. And then it got so big, there was 30 of us in a room. Yeah. And I'd be so pumped. I'd run upstairs. Babe, we had so many God stories. Yeah, I heard you. You guys were so annoying. You're so loud. Can you guys be quiet? All right. You want to cuddle? No, don't touch me. Okay. Next Tuesday, guys, tone it down. You guys were way too excited. My wife's mad at me for three days. Let's chill out. First God story. Let's go. Oh, shh, shh. Oh, she's still asleep. All right, no more God stories. That was too powerful. I'm going to tell you, it got to the point, ticking my wife off so much with men's prayer that I go, "Um, okay, Pete, you got to buy the house across the street. Meaning if you tripped out of my front door and rolled across, you'd hit his front door. I was like, that's the house we need. 
That's the house we need. He goes, dude, I'm not even married. I said, Pete, I don't care. We're going to hold prayer every other Tuesday at your house. And right now it's good you're not married, okay? I need some relief over here. No joke, we did it. And then finally we got it. We, 5 a.m., we snuck in with the real estate coach, got in, and we just walked around a bunch of dudes. Could you imagine if you're the neighbors? 30 dudes walk around this house praying in tongues. Oh, well. Dude, he got that house. He doesn't, we still don't know. How do you afford this? How'd you get this? Then he got, now you got to fill these rooms, bro. You need a wife. We prayed a wife in. Now he's got a kid. And then the greatest pastor in the world, one of the greatest gifts, he came into my office one day and he says, hey, man. I just want to bring you a gift. Oh, sweet. And he goes, it's going to change your life. I was like, what? I'm thinking, Pastor Jurgen, you didn't have to give me a gift. What is it? I'm thinking it's a new car. He pulls out a key. And he goes, no, it's a key to Balboa. I think you need to move prayer there so your wife and you can get along better. I said, you're prophetic. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Our marriage has been going up ever since. You know what I mean? But the power of prayer is my point. <laughs> But if you got a mad wife, there's a ceiling over it. So don't pray too loud. Don't pray too loud. I love it. Mark 9, 29. In some manuscripts, Jesus says this. This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. If we're going to be a church that's going to be a light, that's going to inspire, that's going to get winning, you got to know how to pray as a man to lead your family. Women are naturally, man, they just pray all the time, mostly praying for their husbands. But men, we got to go to it. This is a war, and we got to learn how to pray. Amen. Knowing Jesus is the answer. 1 John 4, 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. You got to know that you got somebody on the inside of you that's got real power, and his name is Jesus. You got to throw that name around and let your light reflect that. He is the way, the truth, and the life. When you get that confidence, that Jesus confidence, that's where demons tremble. They will flee in the name of Jesus. Have you used the authority that Jesus has given you as a believer? You know, you just can say the verse, you know, Romans 8, 37, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We could say it, but do you believe it? Have you conquered anything lately? What do you need to conquer? The next one is think better. Bible talks about guarding your mind. Think better. It's simple. When you have a dumb thought, take it captive. Give it to the Lord and say, you got to help me with this. You know how you break porn addictions? As soon as you have that thought, you say, God, I, I don't want it. But most Christians go to condemnation. They go to shame. So they don't tell anybody. It says, pray for one another. Confess to one another. You want to be set free of something? Confess it to your brother or your sister. So many Christians can't even do that. I'm going to tell you, it's the lie of the enemy in the church that gets you that way. So then you get around fake churches. And you got this big fake church and you're all great and everyone's so spiritual. Skip in. And then the stat in the church is still 50% of people are getting divorced because everything was fine until it wasn't. No, but you didn't confess your sin to one another. Water off a duck's back. You missed the mark. God, take that thought right now. Forgive me of my sin. Take it, Lord. I don't want it. Delete it. And you get better and better and better. I used to have a trucker's mouth. How did I stop cussing? One day. Say, God, you're going to have to help me. Went from a lot of cuss words to a few. Down to none. Now I do it just to freak you out. But you can break any habit if you just think better. It's amazing that what Christians tolerate. You know how I met Pastor John before we were pastors? We both went to Vegas for a, a bachelor party. And when they were all going to the strip club, I'm like, I ain't going. And then my friends made fun of me and fun of me and fun of me. And he goes, you ought to be with that other, our other friend, John. He said the same thing you. He didn't want to dishonor his wife. You guys are so lame. All right, where's John? Hey, what's up, dude? Him and I hung out all night. We had the best time of our life. Next thing you know, now we're pastors and armor bearers for our pastors doing ministry and life together. And we met in Vegas based on a principle that we weren't going to compromise. I don't want to sit in one room in church and be like, amen, amen. And then next thing you know, Monday, you know, smoking a star, cursing up a storm. What, what, it's like, 
Can I be the same person Monday through Sunday? God gives you the power and the ability to be real, authentic Christians that can be the light into the world. I'm going to tell you, he can renew your mind if you just think better. I don't tolerate when guys are talking about, yeah, I don't, you know, hey, let's go, let's go do this. Or, hey, I'm going to, was that girl flirting with you? Were you flirting back? Yeah, man, yeah. My marriage isn't so good. Bro, you need to work it out. No, I got to be true to myself. I just haven't been happy. This isn't about you being happy. True to yourself. Why don't you stay to your commitment to your promise to God that you made in front of all your friends, a covenant relationship. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's just it's so, you know, so harsh in front of the kids. It'd be better for the kids. Okay, why don't you ask the kids about it? What do they think? Think they might have an opinion? Well, I felt like, you know, God said that it was okay. You're a liar. God doesn't go against his own word. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, join my kid on the stupid train. It's just, if we don't call it out in love, people won't change. Guys, like, all right, can we work it out and go to coffee? Yeah, after you make an appointment with my marriage counselor, you show me the appointment, uh, uh, the appointment so you can get help and I'll go have coffee with you. But I'm not going to have coffee with you if you won't do one thing for your marriage. Yeah, I just want to talk about it. I don't have time to talk about it. Why don't you be about it? First thing is confess it. If you do something stupid, confess it in men's prayer. Start there. Watch what God can do in your marriage. And I've watched him restore marriages over and over and over and over and over. When we submit, when we resist the devil, when we get the blueprint, you start having fun again. And God can restore and redeem everything in your marriage, in your life. I don't care if it's finances. I don't care if it's kids. Whatever it is, guard your mind and think better. And when you think stupid, apologize. Repent. Get it right. Alertness and watchfulness means just wake up. Be sober-minded in 1 Peter. Be watchful. Your adversary, for all my nine o'clockers, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in your faith. There is a lion coming to devour, but if you know whose you are, you know the authority God's given you, you're going to tell that devil to flee and he will. I want to tell you that what you do matters. You have to wake up, though, and can't be just this Christian like, oh, nothing's really that big a deal. It's all a big deal. Lives are on the line. There's a lost world out there. It's dark. It's confused. And they need someone to be inspired. Why not you? You made it over the line and got to church today. Are you going to walk out the same or are you going to say, that's it? different today. And it can be small steps of victory, small steps of winning. Winning is contagious. I just want to end on this because I, I, I read on things that inspire me because I want to know how to win. Just to, I'm going to pray for us, but I want to give you just one or two things on winning and then I'm going to pray for us and wrap it up. But you look at Abraham, he played the long game. Man, he waited a long time for kids, but he kept believing, he kept the faith. I look at King David. I look at all these greats. I look at Noah. Would you be willing to get a blueprint to build a boat which never existed before? And being to withstand all the ridicule and finish what you started? How about that conviction? That's a winner. And everyone said, loser, 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 until that first drop of rain hit. And then guess what? Only winner. How you like me now, haters? Oh, yeah, I can't see you down there in the water. It looks cold. You know, we all have this innate ability to want to win. I had this young kid come to my house yesterday and goes, what's your record, Dr. Matt, in the cold plunge? I'm like, seven minutes. Oh, okay. When he hits the eight-minute mark, he winks at me. How annoying is that kid? I should have said like 20. Because deep down, he just wanted to win. And now what sucks, I want to beat him. So I'm going in for nine today with the video to prove it. It's like we want to win. It's like I'm working out with Mark Cohen, who seems like the nicest worship leader in the world. And we're supposed to do 15 reps and blah, blah, blah. And he winks at me and does one more. 
So the next set, of course, what am I going to do? One more. And if you want to know why I can barely get up on the stage, it's because of that thinking. You innately want to win. So how do we stay in it? Prayer. Psalms 1.1, let this be a verse for you. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of the sinners, take on or sit in the company of mockers. But those delight in the law of the Lord who meditate on his stuff day and night. Build some habits. Prayer meditation just every day. Just like the tree needs water to thrive, you need daily spiritual nourishment. This is your soul. You feed your soul through the word of God and prayer. Put on a praise song. How do you feed your soul? I know a lot of dry Christians. You can't keep running a car when the gasoline runs out. When the oil gets old, it blows your engine up. Soul food is right here in the word of God. Last two things is just getting connected in the church. Who you're around matters. They can help your thinking. When you do something or say something, they can help you. That's called discipleship. We don't want to be just the church that's like slapping high fives and people are getting saved, even though that's awesome. We want to be the discipleship church, and we want to get in your stuff to help you be that light. We don't want this to be a hype doctrine. We want this to be a livable doctrine with power. So that's called discipleship. That's why we have DNA. If you've been in our church for a while and haven't been through DNA, my question is, why not? Oh, I don't want to go to two services. Why not? You think your life's going to change? Sticking your toe in one? Check it out. If it's not that good, come tell me. We'll fire everyone. Well, they're all volunteers. I can't fire them. But you know what? We'll just have you teach it on the next round. So get connected. The Bible says that's what it is. And the last one is overcoming and finishing the race. James 1 and 2, consider it pure joy, my brethren and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you will, because you know that the testing of your faith, the testing of your faith will produce perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Trials and challenges are inevitable. And I'm here to encourage you this. Don't let your money define who you are. So many people, they like, oh, I'm I'm a chiropractor. But that's not my identity. How much money you make isn't your identity. Hey, when you're winning, sweet, be generous. When you're not, don't be ashamed. Let God just get you back up on the horse of that winning thing. If you're going for big things, I watched this one dude fall flat on his face at the Olympics. I'm like, oh, he knocked himself out. He got up, did the routine again, and stuck it, boom, like a total boss. I'm like, that's the guy I want to be around. That's a winner. It doesn't matter if you trip over a hurdle. It matters that you get up and you still get up and you win. I watched many people, that one guy, he started last. He ended up winning the race. It's like he dove across the finish line. That's because he just had it in him. I will not quit. You can't just quit because stuff comes your way. Renew your mind and then take this charge from Timothy as I wrap it. Second Timothy 4, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in the store for my, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also those who have longed for his appearing. Let me just tell you, if you could all stand to your feet. I've met some of the greatest friends of my life in this church. You change the scenarios, you change what you do, you change, you know, it's like you just start doing different things and you feel like your soul is getting fed all the time. It used to be just Sundays. Then it would be like Sundays and Wednesdays. Then it was Sunday, Tuesdays, because I had prayer and Wednesdays. But you know what? Now that I look at my circles, Monday through Sunday, living our best life. 
I'm trying to figure out what more is like. We do a lot of things at this church. I'm pumped out of my mind for the night of Christmas this year. I want every person in my practice to come to night of Christmas. Twisted. All these great little things. Because if we could just get them in front of the gospel to feel the joy that we felt, to feel the soul being filled up that we, that we have that same feeling, people will get inspired to change their life. Write your core values. Do the things that we need to do for our family to leave a legacy. Just turn your palms to heaven, and I specifically want to pray. If you're just feeling down, encouraged, or maybe just tired, a little defeated, that God's going to meet you where you're at, you're going to feel restored today. You're maybe going to go take inventory of your relationships, your friendships, what you're doing. Zero toleration for small thinking. God didn't bring you this far, far for you to go back to small thinking. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. God, I thank you for this service. I thank you for your word, the revelation of your instruction manual you left us, God. I thank you that it's your inspired word to inspire us to live a great life, but not just about us and our life, but God, about sharing the gospel to inspiring other people that they can win in life no matter what they've been dealt. That God, you're an overcoming God that can shift circumstances. So I thank you today. Let people be refreshed and renewed. God, as we open up the altar today, let them do things maybe they've never done before. Maybe they've never been to the altar. God, we just ask, Lord, that you stir them to alter their life, to alter the trajectory of where they're going from where they've been. God, that today something's going to shift. So Holy Spirit, move in this place. Heal those hearts that have become guarded or jaded or hardened towards their spouse. Kids that are away and don't want to be around their parents. God, I, I just pray that they are, they are healed and that parents have a revelation of a new strategy. That we don't want to bring religion into this house, God, that we want your spirit to move, that it's fresh, it's real, it's powerful. This is the house of transformation, not on a sticker, not on a logo, but lives are transformed because of your spirit, Lord. God, I thank you for what you have done, but I thank you for what you're about to do in this next season, that everything is about to change. God, I thank you that you're renewing minds, that those that keep going back to habitual sin, we break it in the name of Jesus. That God, they learn how to armor up, they learn how to pray, they learn how to fast, they take territory and get breakthrough in this season. God, we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen. For more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.